After we'd eaten lunch, and Bunny's demeanor had softened, he said, I know what you tell the subjects, but what's the score on your fixation for Stagger Lee? He lit a cigarette and pushed himself back in the Studebaker's seat. You're really hot under the collar for all this devil malarkey. How could I say it? Staggerly or Stackily or Staggerly has a different modality for every mind and mouth that renders it, I've come to learn. It is a distinctly American song, and like this fair nation, it is impoverished and wars with itself. Its myriad verses contain the stress of inequality, the iniquity of plenty versus want. Staggerly is a mirror that reflects the desires and sometimes the shadowy animus of every man or woman that gives it voice. But with every morphology I've found, researched, and documented, I become more convinced that there's an er version of the song when it first divorced itself from real human events, the sad story of Lee Shelton and William Lyons, and became the upwelling of American cultures before its popularity shattered it into a million scintillate shards. But there was more, a beyond to my landscape, a horizon to the fields and lakes of my waking and slumbering mind. How could I tell him about the dream of Chautauqua? How could I tell him about the surface of the water shimmering, the warmth of black faces, black hands comforting me, black voices singing to me, me, a child, arrested in forward movement, still caught in an eddy. There are currents in the Mississippi and the Arkansas and the Ohio that turn upon themselves forever, pockets roiling, where fish live their whole lives without escape. The man, Insul, holding my mother down, grinning, that maybe I'd never been happy, and never could be happy, unless I could get back to that place where my mother wasn't dead and a Negro minstrel's song swaddled me. That was from the second story in this collection, known as My Heart Struck Sorrow, from this book, A Lush and Seething Hell, Two Tales of Cosmic Horror by John Horner Jacobs. And this is my pick for week number three of Horror Mayhem. Uh, this week, obviously, was Cosmic Horror, and I've had this book for a, f a little while now, a few months. It's just been sitting on my shelf, but it's right there in the title, Cosmic Horror, so I picked it. And uh, I was really excited to get to this because uh, prior to this, I had read John Horner Jacobs' first novel, um, Southern Gods, um, which w this was his debut novel, and I believe it was nominated for the Bram Stoker Award. I read this a few years ago, and I really, really loved it, um, so much so that I bought this copy. Um, yeah, this was a really great uh, uh, Lovecraftian story about... Um, uh, a, a blues man named Ramblin' John Haster, uh, and a mysterious, uh, you know, a, a, and a mysterious phantom radio station. So I was really looking forward to this collection because uh, John Horner Jacobs seems to know his way around um, Lovecraftian uh, storytelling. Um, and I honestly, I was a little bit disappointed. I didn't hate it, but it, it wasn't exactly all that I wanted it to be. But uh, I'll get into that. So this is a collection of two novellas. Really, the, the second one's more like a short novel, um, but basically it's two novellas. Um, and they both sort of uh, cover a lot of the same themes in terms of uh, Lovecraft and that kind of stuff. Uh, the first story is called The Sea Dreams It Is the Sky, and it's about a uh, young South American woman from a fictional um, South American country called Magara, um, which has uh, been undergoing a lot of uh, strife, uh, civil war, dictatorships, uh, military juntas, that kind of thing. Um, and she uh, strikes up a friendship with uh, a, this old man with one eye, who's known as the Eye, and uh, he basically reveals to her that he's actually a famed Magaran poet named Rafael Avendano, um, who has uh, basically been kind of living in, uh, in secrecy after all this time. Uh, people thought he was dead. And um, by being by being friends with him, she discovers this uh, mysterious text that he was uh, translating, which he uh, translated as uh, a little night work, which is this strange, arcane text full of uh, weird drawings and, and occultish sounding things. And um, she basically he basically goes off to return to Magara, his home country, and while there, um, she's left in his apartment um, to look after it while he's gone, and um, she starts working on her own translation of A Little Night Work, and um, things sort of escalate from there. Um, mysterious, uh, strange things escalate. Um, and to be honest, um, this first one didn't really work for me. Um, it takes place, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a South American setting, South American characters. Um, there's a lot of references to, you know, Borges, um, uh, Pablo Neruda, people like that, you know, famous uh, Latin American, South American poets. 
uh, and writers. Uh, and the whole thing sort of seems to be going for a similar vibe of, a, you know, kind of a, a South American sort of magical realist um, horror-ish story, you know, kind of, you know, like, like, like Borges or, or, or people like that. Um, but to me, um, it was a little too opaque, I think. I mean, I know part of cosmic horror is that it's kind of unknowable and you're not really given... Um, satisfactory answers a lot of the time or, or very clear answers a lot of the time but I don't know for me it just didn't really leave me with anything it was well written both of the stories are very well written um, they're full of you know detail and color and uh, and they feel very uh, lived in but something about this just didn't work for me I think part of it also in the case of the first story was the fact that um, you know it's a South American story South American characters kind of recreating that whole vibe it, it didn't quite come off for me. It, it felt a little bit like an author, like playing pretend to me. Um, not saying, you know, that as a white man he can't write about, you know, cultures outside of his own. But but uh, while I could tell that he did a lot of research and he clearly sort of knew what he was talking about, it, it, it didn't really feel... The characters in the world didn't really feel lived in to me. They didn't really feel authentic. They felt more like caricatures or like... Uh, it almost felt like a parody of like that style of like South American fiction, and I don't really know if that's what he was going for. Um, I didn't hate it, but it was just okay. But the uh, the second story, which was is much longer and covers a lot of the same ground as uh, Southern Gods, I enjoyed a lot more. Um, that was called uh, My Heart Struck Sorrow, as I said. Uh, it's about a, a a man who works for the Library of Congress. Who, um, uh, he, he, in the in the music section, he's sort of into like ethnomusicology and all that stuff. And um, him and, and a colleague discover um, the, uh, a series of recordings and a journal from uh, this uh, very famous uh, field recording um, guy, sort of uh, based off of like an Alan Lomax type character uh, named Harlan Parker, um, who um, was uh, tasked back in uh, the Depression to um, catalog all the, you know, these folk songs of the people, you know, the common man and that kind of thing for the Library of Congress. So um, it's about the main character Cromwell and his partner Hattie basically working together to, to digitize all these recordings, to, to archive everything, um, because uh, this uh, nobody knows what happened to Harlan Parker. He just disappeared mysteriously, and um, nobody has seen these recordings before. Um, but his uh, his his uh, descendant has died out, and and they and she's bequeathed um, the the estate to them. Um, but as they uh, as uh, as Cromwell. Um, listens to more of the recordings and reads more of uh, of Harlan Parker's journal, um, things get deeper and darker. And um, as you heard from a little bit of that, um, it goes and it covers a lot of the same grounds as Southern Gods in the sense that it talks about sort of um, racial inequality. Um, it goes and it, it, it goes into sort of like er, um, early uh, 1900s American history, um, you know, folk songs, uh, field recordings, that whole kind of world. Um, and I feel it, I think it recreates it very, very well. It felt very, very believable to me. Um, very, very, uh, unlike the first story, it, it felt very, like, very all-encompassing, very lived in. Um, and it was very, very well written. And there was, a, uh, and I, I felt like a lot of the themes that he was covering in this story, I think, came off a lot better in terms of, as I said, you know, sort of racial inequality. He talks a lot about, um, how, um, the act of field recording that a lot of these people undertook, you know, like Alan Lomax and stuff, was in itself a kind of exploitation, um, and how it's sort of a lot of the the rage and pain that that black black people felt or st I guess feel still, um, but but especially in this time period when it was when this story is taking place, um, how that sort of rage and pain kind of translates itself into music and how that can have its own sort of demonic power. I thought it was really really good, um, but again. Um, it just, the ending didn't quite work for me. I mean, it, it's frustrating because obviously, like, as I said, it's, it's, it's cosmic horror. It's very Lovecraftian. It's not meant to be, um, sort of a, uh, uh, an easy story to understand. It's not meant, it's not meant to wrap everything up in a nice little bow. And I and I'm fine with that. But to me, I just felt like in the case of both of these stories, especially, I felt like the journey was more interesting than the destination. Um, so, really, like, while I enjoyed the second one a lot more, it still didn't totally leave me with a whole lot um, in terms of, like, you know, leaving an impression or, or, or having me, like, you know, sit and, and think about things. Um, it was it was just, it was decent. 
I didn't hate it. I didn't hate uh, the other story either, but but I just felt like, I don't know, maybe he bit off more than he could chew here. I don't know. I don't know what, what it could have done differently to work for me, but for me, it just personally didn't uh, didn't really come off. But I did really enjoy John Horner Jacobs' writing. It's a little bit different from Southern Gods. Southern Gods has a very kind of pulpy edge to it, very sort of Robert E. Howard-esque. These feel a lot more... Um, almost like an American Clive Barker in the, in the way that they explore sort of uh, sex and violence and pain and death. And um, the, the writing style is, is much more um, florid and poetic um, than it is in his first book. Um, but it was interesting and, and it was well written. I just don't think it was entirely successful. Um, but I did enjoy my time with it and um, I would like to read more of his stuff eventually. Um, if I, I don't know if he has, I'll have to look it up. I don't know if he has any more novels or anything, but but I would really like to read more of his stuff. He's a very interesting, very uh, talented writer, even if this didn't completely work for me. I am glad that I read it. I know I didn't go as in-depth as I as I have uh, in my other reviews, but I, I mean, this this one just didn't leave me with a whole lot. I mean, check it out if, if that sounds interesting to you. I mean, that, it's a great cover, great title. It's very well written. I'd be interested to see what other people think of it. Maybe they get more out of it than I do. Um but yeah, so that was a, a Lush and Seething Hell by John Horner Jacobs, and uh, that was my video for week three of Horror Mayhem. Uh, next week, uh, for the final week, we are reading uh, Folk Horror, and I've already started the book I'm reading for that. It's kind of a long book, so I don't know if I will be able to finish it in time for the end of Horror Mayhem, but I do at least want to get a video out when I finish it. So uh, hopefully you'll see that when it comes out, and um, I'll talk to you guys later. All right, bye.